Hi, I'm Dr. Joe and I am to lovethatface.com and I think this is going to be one of the more important videos that we do. If you follow our channel, you know that all I do is cosmetic facial surgery and my signature procedure is facelift surgery. If you're thinking about having a facelift, please watch this video because it may save you a lot of time and frustration and educate you. The title of this video is the 10 essential steps of facelift surgery. Now, in reality, there's probably more than 10 essential steps, but there's some things that are very important. The whole um, mystery around facelift needs to be discussed. So 40 years ago, a facelift was a procedure where they went all around the top of the skull and it was called a full facelift and it was four and a half days in the hospital and things have improved so much with surgery, anesthesia, biomaterials. Now a facelift is two and a half hours in my in-office surgery center and it is a customizable procedure where the facelift is really from here to here and it doesn't do anything in here. So remember that here to here it doesn't do anything in here. So people frequently doing their eyelids, maybe cheek implants, chin implant, laser, brow lift. Um, but a facelift by itself is an operation, and unfortunately I'm a good model for the jowls and the extra neck skin. So if I had a facelift, it would make me look like this. Now, I wanna to talk to you about a couple things. There are two main things that any successful facelift surgeon has to do. This week, I did my 1,060th facelift. A lot of people don't even get close to that in a lifetime, but we do several a week and uh, about 100 a year because it's my favorite procedure and I just do faces. And there are so many people that try to make this a magic procedure. The mini lift, the S lift, the vampire lift, the thread lift. I gotta tell you something, and this is absolutely true. If you have excess skin right here, there's one way to get rid of it predictably, and that is to do a lift and cut off that extra skin. If you, you can't do it with Thermage, you can't do it with Altera, you can't do it with Cool Sculpting, you can't do it with Profound. I have people that come to my office, they don't want surgery, they end up spending three times the amount of a facelift, and I see them two years later and we do a facelift. It's not that those machines are bad, and they can do little small things, but if you have enough skin where you can grab it here, it's not gonna happen. And back to these small lifts. You know, a facelift was really um, kind of discovered that process and that way of surgery about a century ago. And a lot of those standards still hold true. There's a right way to do it. And so when you hear about these miracle lifts that I was alluding to, you know, one hour procedure, no bandages, local anesthesia, drive home, you don't have to miss work you're getting robbed, you're missing something. Now, if you're 34 years old and have very minimal skin and you can do a little tiny mini lift, that's fine. Most of the patients I see need a real facelift. And our average uh, facelift age is about 53. And now that includes people that I do small lifts on that are 42 and people that I do big lifts on that are 82, okay? So when do you need a facelift? Well, nobody needs one, but when you look in the mirror or you're doing a selfie or talking on FaceTime and you start getting this in this, you're a candidate for a facelift. As a facelift surgeon, there are two things I have to do. Number one is safe surgery. So I have to have safe anesthesia. I have to know what I'm doing medically. I have to work these patients up properly and they have to wake up, okay? So we have a fully accredited surgery center in our office. The second thing is natural outcomes, all right? A surgeon is only as good as his outcomes. And so many people are worried that they're gonna look like some of these movie stars that we see that are pulled back and look funny. So you want a surgeon that can do it safely and do it naturally. So what do you want to look for? You want to look for safety, natural outcomes. You should be able to look at somebody's website and see hundreds of pictures if they do a lot of facelifts. You should be able to talk to their patients. Your doctor should be somebody you can relate to that will give you their cell phone that you feel good about. And I could talk on and on and on about this, but I want to get back to what we're going to do. Now, usually my videos are just very off the cuff like this, but we're going to go into a little lecture video now, kind of a PowerPoint presentation, and I'm going to talk about what I feel are the 10 most essential uh, aspects of facelift surgery that you should look for. And I really appreciate you watching this video, but I think it'll be worth it for you. And I'm a lucky guy because I get to come to work, and on Sunday nights, I'm really excited about coming to work and doing a facelift. And you know, I ask some of my friends how they're doing, and they say, oh, I'm living the dream. And they say that sarcastically. 
I honestly feel like I am living the dream. I've got a great office. I've got a great staff. I love what I do. So if you're interested in facelift surgery, look at this video and you can reach us at lovethatface.com or 804-934-FACE. I'm Dr. Joe Niamtu, lovethatface.com. Hi, I'm Dr. Joe Niamtu, and let's get on with it and talk about the 10 essential steps of successful face and neck lift surgery. So first things first are always important. And what do you look for in a facelift surgeon? Well, you need to look for qualifications. You want to make sure your surgeon is board certified in a specialty that deals with the face. And there are numerous specialties that do that. Specific specialty or degree can have little or nothing to do with natural outcomes. It's not the numbers behind somebody's name or their title. It's really their experience. There may be people that say only go to a board certified plastic surgeon. Well, there's some very good board certified plastic surgeons and some of them may do many, many breast cases, but very few facelifts. Well, you may have other types of surgeons that do hundreds of facelifts and no breast lifts. So you need to look for the experience of that surgeon. And remember, no single specialty owns the face. There are numerous specialties that are qualified to perform facelift surgery. And doctors, just like everybody else, are competitive and argue with each other and who's the best, who does it, who should do it, who shouldn't do it, what's the name of your specialty. What you want to do is somebody that does safe and effective facelift surgery and does a ton of it. That's who you want to be your doctor. Uh, select a surgeon who performs a lot of the surgery that you want to have, what I just said. Uh, as a board certified maxillofacial surgeon and a board certified cosmetic facial surgeon, I've had decades of training and experience in facial surgery, and I feel very confident in what I do. I love doing facelifts, and it's my signature procedure. So all I do is faces, no boobs, no bellies, no buds. Whomever you consider for a surgeon, Look for his or her experience, because that, in the end, is what matters. Now, natural outcomes. Your surgeon should be able to show you hundreds of before and after cases. So I do about 100 facelifts a year, and I've done you know, over 1,100 at the time of this recording. And so any surgeon that is experienced should be able to put you in touch with their patients that have had similar situations, similar experiences, similar surgery. And again, they should be able to show you hundreds of before and after pictures. Your surgeon should have uh, a great team and they should be well liked and largely have great reviews. Academics, uh, very frequently, some of the best surgeons uh, are involved in teaching, publishing uh, and lecturing, and they're more immersed in their profession. And again, I want this to be about facelift surgery and not necessarily a promotion for me, but I've written six textbooks. I lecture all over the world and I teach uh, all specialties, uh, ENT, plastic surgery, dermatology, ophthalmology, maxillofacial surgery, anybody that wants to learn facelift surgery, uh, I teach courses. Now let's talk about the 10 most important steps in facelift surgery. So these are essential for safe, long lasting and natural results. Omitting some of these steps can make a negative difference on the result and the longevity. So all these steps are important. Different surgeons may employ slightly different steps, but the really good ones usually follow pretty much the 10 steps that I'm going to talk about. Some of these steps may be omitted or shortened in very small lifts for younger patients. However, 99% of my patients need these full 10 steps. So, Number one is patient safety. That supersedes everything else. You have to have a safe facility. A, um, I have a fully accredited surgery center in my office with two operating rooms, and we follow the same standards as do the local hospitals. We have board certified anesthesia providers. We are available. Uh, I give all my patients my cell phone, as do my staff, and you can contact us when you need us. I've always say to patients that if you can't call your doctor, you chose the wrong doctor. Uh, affability, you need to look for a doctor 
who is easy to talk to and listens well, and somebody you just feel good about, them, their staff, and their office, and their team concept. And also, reputation and reviews are usually a good indicator. Now, one of the first things we do, actually the first thing we do when we go in the operating room is we do what's called a timeout. And we all, the team assembles, anesthesia, the uh, head nurse, uh, me, the surgeon, we look at the patient's information, what we're going to do, what we're supposed to be doing that day, make sure we're doing the right procedure on the right areas on the right patient, and go over any allergies or history and physical or anesthetic concerns. It's very important. So if you look a little bit at the aging face, uh, young people have all their volume and tight skin and their face is tapered like an upside down egg. As we age, we lose this volume and our skin sags and our tapered face becomes square like a right side up egg. So you can think about egg foo young and egg foo old if you want, but this analogy shows also, your surgeon has to be an expert anatomist. There are a lot of nerves that provide feeling and move the facial muscles and veins and arteries. So the best surgeons are the best anatomists. The goal of a facelift is to take the square aging face and make it a youthful tapered face, like I pointed out earlier. And this is just an excellent representation of a patient before and after a facelift. Look how we've tapered their face, tightened their neck, eliminated their jowls and given them back that nice tapered egg shaped face. So our first step is what's called tumescent anesthesia. This is a very dilute solution of lidocaine and epinephrine. And what this does is provides local anesthesia. It also constricts the blood vessels to decrease bleeding. It allows the anesthesiologist to use less drugs so patients have less nausea and vomiting. And it also helps pre-dissect the areas where it's injected because it separates the tissues somewhat, making less surgical dissection. The next step is facial liposuction. So basically, all facelift patients, or most of them, uh, have fat in various areas of their face. And we will uh, perform liposuction on this fat, shown in these pictures in yellow. You can see in the top left picture the fat actually coming through the liposuction hose. And we'll go in there and we do what we call really uh, liposculpture. We don't remove all the fat. We layer it and kind of shape it and sculpt it the way we want to. So it's very important to remove the excess fat, but leave enough fat to have a nice soft result. Step three is platysmoplasty, and some surgeons eliminate this step. I think it's one of the most important steps in facelift surgery and do it on 99% of my facelifts. And basically, if you have the bands of skin and muscle, like shown in the left uh, on, on your neck, if you don't do a platysmoplasty, I think that your facelift is not going to last as long. It's not going to be as tight, and these bands are going to return earlier. If you look at the picture on the right, what we're doing is cutting out uh, a portion in the middle and joining this much like uh, shoestrings on a shoe to tie it back to a nice tight youthful net, uh, youthful neck without the bands. Now, facelift incisions are very important and a lot of people make incisions similar to the one shown here. This is a terrible way to make an incision. This is not my patient, but this is a patient who had a facelift surgeon who was very good at many other types of procedures, but just wasn't good at facelifts because he scalped this patient and that's permanent hair loss. She has lost her sideburn. So in, uh, here's kind of the basic way I make most of my facelift incisions. And most of the incision is hidden behind the ear and in the hairline, as you can see by the blue lines. It is important not to change the hairline behind the ear so patients can still wear their hair up. It's important not to move the sideburn. And if you look at the picture on the right, that's taken about six weeks after facelift surgery uh, done by uh, me. And uh, this is one of my cases. And again, you can hardly see the scar. So if this is done correctly, most he people heal very well. When we make incisions in the hairline, this is a very specialized incision. And it's a beveled incision. 
um, similar to when you're filleting a fish. The scalpel is laid down so it cuts across the hair follicles at a certain angle that they'll grow back and they'll grow back through the scar. So if you look at the patient on the right, look behind their ear, you really can't see my incision because the hair has grown back through that. That's called a transfollicular incision. Now, here's what one of my average facelift incisions look like in about one week. We only use dissolvable stitches, so there's no stitches to take out. And these are pictures uh, of before and after, uh, these are after facelift. And I usually take my after pictures anywhere from three to four months. So if you look in front of the ear, the scars are imperceptible. If you look at the hairline, you can barely see any scar. The sideburn is in its natural. Again, look in front of the ear, look behind the ear. I pride myself very, very significantly in taking time and having 30 years of experience to craft these incisions because the incision is the signature of the surgeon. And all that we do on the inside, and that's a lot, the only thing that the patient ever sees and the hairdresser and their friends are the incisions. And again, this is, if you look at these groups of pictures, we'll start on the left. The first picture is before, the second picture is after, the third picture is the other ear before, the fourth picture is the other ear after. I really work hard to provide a natural scar. Here is a, a male patient, obviously. And again, this is after facelift surgery, probably 90 days. Very hard to see the scar. Looks very natural. Okay, let's move on. So the next step is the dissection. We will separate the skin from the deeper tissues by using a little instrument to begin and then using scissors to actually make a pocket between the skin and the deeper structures. That's the dissection. Once we get under the skin, there are numerous tissue planes, and one of the groups of tissue is referred to as the SMAS, the superficial musculoaponeurotic system, and this is the deeper tissue around the muscle that we tighten, and it's very important to address the SMAS. If you don't do that, you will not have a natural long-lasting facelift. And by pulling the SMAS, we can actually reset the droopy tissues of the face. And not only do we do this on the muscular layer, but we do it on the skin as well. And knowing how to pull this and what directions to pull it makes a very natural facelift. If you don't understand it, this is when people have crazy windblown type looks. So some, patient, uh, some doctors don't treat the SMAS. That's inappropriate in my uh, feeling. You can plicate this mass. You can perform what's called a deep uh, plane SMAS dissection, uh, or you can do a SMASectomy. In all honesty, you'll hear some doctors say, only do this, never do this. Whatever works well in the hands of that particular surgeon. Uh, some people like deep plane. There is a larger incidence of nerve damage and uh, a little bit longer recovery. I prefer smasectomy. That has worked effectively and safely in my hands for well over a thousand procedures. And by doing the smasectomy, we're actually removing a, uh, a little window of the smas and then pulling the tissues back together in the direction that we desire uh, based on the direction of the sagging tissues. So this would be just like if you were taking your waist in on a pair of pants and you were going to take out a piece of the waistband and sew the uh, sides back together to make it smaller. And you can see on the picture on the right, hopefully you're not grossed out by that, that um, on the far right, I've removed that section of SMAS. And on the left of that picture, you can see how we have uh, those arrows showing where the stitches are to pull the face tight on the deep layer, which is very important. Uh, next, we perform liposuction on the jowl. The jowl area is one of the most hated and resistant areas on facelift surgery. So we have to give this extra special care and we usually remove some of the fat on the jowl as well. At this point, we address the backside of the platysma muscle. 
and that's the area back by the ear. So we've already tightened the platysma muscle in the midline with the shoestring suture, and now we're going to tighten the back. Again, that's a very important procedure. Finally, after the deep layers are tight, we have this extra skin. And these triangles of skin that you see me elevating, these are actually the extra skin that was on the under the chin, the turkey neck and the jowls. And that skin is now transposed and the excess is in the back of the ear, which is removed. It is very important to, for the surgeon to understand in which direction to naturally pull the skin. And when you see people that looks like, look like they've been in a wind tunnel or they're pushed back, there are several reasons. Number one, the surgeon doesn't understand the correct vector or angle to pull the skin, or he or she doesn't understand how much or how hard to pull it, or they, they're just not putting something back like implants or fat or something to add volume. And they're pulling the skin over a skeletonized face in the wrong direction. And that's a mortal sin of facelift surgery. Now we have the extra skin and in the hair bearing areas that we once again utilize this specialized fillet type incision so that we cut across the hair follicles to allow them to grow back in a natural hairline. And that's very important. If you want to see if a facelift surgeon is good, look at their hairlines, look at their incisions, and look at the earlobes on their patient. The earlobe is extremely important. And this is an often botched step of facelift surgery where people overcut the skin, which causes the earlobe to hang on the cheek. And when the patient stands up, the cheek and produces what's called a pixie ear. And if you see this, this is just a, a, a rookie mistake. Experienced surgeons know how to avoid this. And I end up fixing these from people that come in from other offices where the facelift was just done incorrectly. So this is what the final step, what I call step 10. I use totally dissolvable stitches. Depending on patient's hairlines or their request of where to place the incisions, you can see that the, the patient on the left, the incisions are placed under the sideburn and under the hairline. Uh, this is one of my cases. And the reason that I use these incisions on this patient is because she had previous facelift and these incisions were already there. I prefer the incisions on the right where you can see that my stitches in the sideburn and my stitches in the hairline are all hidden. The only stitches you see are the dissolvable stitches in front of the ear. The crust on this patient's face is from the laser resurfacing that we did at the same time as a facelift. So no sutures to be removed uh, in my surgeries. Uh, I use drains and I'll tell you, I. I did not used to, and I think they make a huge difference to leave a drain in for any, anywhere from one to three days. Uh, you really don't feel it. It, it sucks out a, a lot of blood, and by getting that blood out of there and that fluid, it reduces the inflammation, improves the result, and really speeds up the healing. Uh, I only use a dressing overnight, and then we take it off unless the patient likes the dressing and they're welcome to leave it on. Uh, the healing for a facelift is generally about two weeks, and uh, I tell patients that our average patients are able to get out of the house or go back to work at two weeks, some of them a little bit earlier, some of them take a little longer. And if they were getting ready for a class reunion or a big wedding, then I'd give yourself four to six weeks for recovery. I'm going to go over some actual facelift cases that I've done, and a lot of these patients have had other procedures, eyelids facial implants, brow lift, laser resurfacing, uh, and let's take a look at them. So here's a, a patient in her early 50s, sagging jowls and neck skin. Uh, I think the before and after is evident. We also did uh, cheek implants on that patient, which made a big difference. I don't think I need to point out all the improvements of the eyelids, the neck, the turkey gobbler, the jowls, um, and this patient had great improvement, very happy. Again, facelift is for the lower face, so it really improves the neck, the chin, area under the chin, the jowls, and the jawline. 
typical facelift patient. She's in good shape. She exercises. She just has this extra skin and uh, doing some eyelid surgery, uh, some cheek implants and a facelift. Look at the neck. Look at the jowls. Another really good case, which I think is very natural. That's facelift and laser resurfacing. Here's a patient that had bariatric surgery, lost 120 pounds, and we removed that extra skin. Obviously, you can see a big difference. Uh, a younger patient with just hereditary volume loss in the mid face, jowls and some neck skin, and we performed a facelift, a smaller version, and uh, cheek implants. So facelifts are age appropriate. Here's a younger patient with a smaller lift. Again, some people just have this hereditary heaviness and skin excess, and it just makes all the difference in the world. I really love looking at these pictures because there's a story, a happy story with each of these patients, and it just makes me feel good, makes me feel proud. Another before and after with full face laser and eyelid surgery. And again, this is just a typical patient. As we age, we just start to look uh, uh, tired and older. And when we tighten everything up, we just look younger and fresher. Here's a patient that uh, presented to my office and she saw another surgeon and they told her that she needed to lose 80 pounds, but we, uh, she was very healthy and we performed facelift and eyelid surgery and a chin implant. And I think just a super result. She sent me a lot of patients. Another similar patient. Here's a patient with a lot of fullness in their jowls and neck. Here's a patient that we perform brow lift, upper lids, lower lids, cheek implants, chin implant, facelift, full face laser resurfacing. Uh, obviously made a huge difference in a happy patient. Another patient with brow lift, upper lids, lower lids, cheek implants, chin implant, full face laser, and facelift. Here's a patient, excess jowls and neck skin, a smaller lift, defining the area under the chin, getting rid of that extra skin and jowl. Patient with a lot of hereditary skin, tightening that all up. Uh, males, you know, it's basically the same thing. Here's a patient with uh, male, another patient with a lot of skin, bigger facelift. Here's a patient with a uh, uh, eyelid surgery, cheek implants, chin implant, uh, face and neck lift. And this picture was taken in about a month, I think, after the surgery. And another patient with skin excess before and after facelift. One more male patient. This is taken about three months after facelift. I realize this has been a long presentation, but if you're considering having such an important procedure as a face and neck lift or cosmetic facial surgery, it may be the most important 30 minutes you could spend. So again, I'm such a lucky guy that I get to do neck by Niamtu and make people look and feel better about themselves every day. When I go to bed on Sunday night, I'm really pumped up to wake up Monday and go to work and do my facelifts and my other cosmetic surgery. I hope I can do this forever. They're going to have to carry me out. I really love it. And uh, I'm so fortunate to have such a great staff because my staff, my facility, my training, education, dedication and experience 20 times in a row, we have won best cosmetic surgeon or best plastic surgeon in Richmond, Virginia or in the state of Virginia and I just love what I do. So if you're considering cosmetic facial surgery, specifically uh, facelift and neck lift, I'm Dr. Joe Niamtu, lovethatface.com, Richmond, Virginia, 804-934-FACE, and feel free to email me, and I'm always happy to arrange consults or talk to people about their situation. It has truly been my honor to speak with you. Thank you so much and have a great day.